the mystery of consciousness goes back as long as you like. And there's always been this this challenge of trying to relate mind to to matter. And we have the broad metaphysical perspectives of idealism, so everything is mind and matter is secondary, or materialism, everything is matter and mind is somehow a property of matter. Dualism, they're both in different realms. And this hard problem coined by David Chalmers is the, the modern landmark reference for this much more historically ancient conundrum. And it poses it in terms of the relationship between not mind so much, but conscious experience specifically. And how is it that physical stuff could be identical to or give rise to conscious experience? So he says something like this. I'm trying to remember it, so it might be a little paraphrased. But um, you know, how and why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and, and yet it does. So this is the hard problem. Physical stuff going on, but it seems however you might think about what's happening in purely physical stuff, it's still a deep mystery how and why there should be anything like an experience happening. Now, that experience doesn't seem to be the sort of thing that physical stuff could ever have or exhibit. That's, that's the intuition of the hard problem. Then Chalmers contrasts that with the easy problem. The easy problems, of course, not easy in practice, but they're supposedly conceptually easy in the sense, it's like, how does the brain work? You know, you've got this complex physical mechanism. How does it work? And we don't know yet, but there's no conceptual difficulty in principle with like, if we knew every neuron and every connection and we're sufficiently smart, we'd be able to figure out how brains generate every behavior that, that organisms like us exhibit. Um, and so... If you cleave the world this way, then the intuition is solving the easy problem in 600 years or however long it would take, we'd still be faced with a hard problem. And I think this is not uh, a reliable intuition. So the real problem approach, which is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek name for it, and um, it's what a lot of people do, so I'm not at all claiming exclusivity or even precedence in, in thinking this way. It's, it's aligned with neurophenomenology, Francisco Varela and, and so on, and a lot of cognitive neuroscience in general, is basically saying, look, instead of addressing the hard problem head on and trying to understand how these two different domains relate or, or are aspects of a fundamental underlying um, reality, we start more pragmatically. Consciousness exists. It has properties, experiences of different kinds are different from each other. And let's try and explain and account for how these properties relate to the underlying mechanisms in the brain and, and the body um, and build explanatory bridges, not merely correlations, but explanatory bridges that say, oh, yeah, this is why free will feels the way it feels because of this kind of underlying mechanism that has this function. And the thought is that as we do this, the sense of mystery accompanying the hard problem will dissolve and maybe evaporate entirely. Maybe not. Maybe there'll be a residue of mystery that remains, which could be for many reasons. You know, maybe there is fundamentally a mystery, or maybe we're just psychologically predisposed or, or, um, or um, condemned to perceiving there to be a mystery because we ourselves are conscious. So this is a distinctive mystery, and we're trying to have an explanation to something we actually are rather than just something we observe. Um, so there's a hugely interesting like, set of future possibilities where in this intuition of a hard problem may reshape itself and dissolve or reframe, but become reframed by following this um, pragmatic real problem strategy. When you talk about the hard problem potentially dissolving, it's just so hard to figure out how matter could somehow give rise to something like experience when, you know, maybe before the, the, the first time experience appeared in the universe, there was nothing like experience and then matter does something and experience sort of exists. Help me think about how we might get around the hard problem to the point where it, it dissolves. I think this is the role of theory. And, and it's not saying that that isn't a hard problem or that these larger issues of the first emergence of consciousness are not you know, worth thinking about. I think they really are. I mean, for me, this is one of the most existentially challenging 
thoughts to have is that it's entirely possible that this whole history of the existence of the universe might have largely gone on in the absence of any experience whatsoever you know it's easy to say like in the subjective darkness but even that's misleading because darkness is an experience um in oblivion um and that that's really weird isn't it to think that experience of any kind may have arisen just in one little backwater of the universe for perhaps a rather uh, rather negligible um, period of time. But anyway, that, that aside, I'm, so I'm not trying to discourage people thinking about, about these, um, these grand, the mystery in its grandest terms at all. Um, but what are the pragmatic strategies? If, if, if in practice we don't make much headway by focusing on these things, what's the alternative? And here I think is there are alternatives which is a historically fortunate position to be in in, in in science and philosophy at the moment. We have the tools. And the tools are of two kinds. From one perspective, we can ask, why do we feel there's a hard problem? Chalmers, in fact, calls this the meta-problem of consciousness. And I think it's a very interesting thing to address mentioned it a minute ago there might be something about the fact that we ourselves are conscious that inevitably means that we perceive things as problematic in terms of their relation to each other that we wouldn't if we were simply observing some some other system that had you know different aspects and different ways of being in the world so that's useful we can look at why and how we think there's a hard problem and then the other going from the other side is just to say like yeah okay so let's let's build models that go from mechanism to phenomenology and not to phenomenology as a thing that exists versus doesn't, but as something that has describable, differentiable, distinguishable properties. One example, in my group, we do a lot of work on visual experience and visual hallucinations. Visual hallucinations have distinct characters depending on their etiology, psychedelic hallucinations are different from hallucinations that arise in Parkinson's disease um, or in psychosis. And so we can build computational models that characterize these differences. And they're differences in experience. They're not differences in function or behavior. And by then testing these against people who have these kinds of experiences, like which, which matches better and so on, um, we're getting a mechanist. We're going beyond correlation and we're getting a handle on some of the mechanisms involved. And that have a theoretical principle as well. So we'll, I'm sure we'll get onto this. But you know, my preferred hypothesis generator for this pragmatic approach is the idea that the brain is a prediction machine and that every form of experience is a form of brain-based prediction. Now, this is almost certainly not true. You know, like I think the stage we're at, all theories are wrong. It's just some are more wrong than others. Um, but we're at a stage, I think, in, in this research where it's, it's sufficient for a theory to be not entirely wrong so long as it's also generative and productive and leads to ideas that we can, we can test. And so I like this approach for that reason. It seems as though, for most of us, that perception is the result of reading out sensory signals. This predictive processing view flips that on its head. It's not a readout of the sensory signals, but the content of the brain's top-down predictions. I use the term controlled hallucination in various talks in my book because it captures this inversion. Subscribe to I'm Curious for more clips and watch the full interview on Patreon. Thanks for watching.